Good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to our weekly virtual medical grand rounds. Today is something a little bit different. Um, so it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Alex Doroshenko from our department. Um, Alex obtained his medical degree from the, and I'm, I know I'm going to really not do a good job with this, but Nep Nepropetrovsk. Nepro State Medical Academy in the Ukraine in 1994. Um, after graduation, he was uh, awarded the Edmund Muskie Graduate Fellowship to study public administration and public health in the US. He completed his master's of public health degree at George Washington University in Washington, DC, and then completed a res some residency training in pediatrics and public health in the UK, and a fellowship in pediatric infectious diseases at Dalhousie University in Canada. He's worked uh, as a consultant medical epidemiologist at the Health Protection Agency in the UK and as a provincial medical officer of health in the Department of Health in New Brunswick before joining the Division of Preventive Medicine at the University of Alberta in 2013. He's currently an associate professor within our department and adjunct professor at the School of Public Health. He is also a medical officer of health for the Alberta Health Services and a TB physician at the Provincial TB Services. He's an investigator within the Canadian Immunization Research Network and uh, works on a number of mathematical modeling projects on pertussis, measles, varicella, and now COVID-19. He's a member of the COVID-19 uh, Alberta Health Services um, uh, Scientific Advisory Group. So we thought it would be really interesting to hear about mathematical modeling, how, how it's undertaken, what, um, what, how the information is used, and so on. So we uh, um, invited Alex to give this grand rounds on the role of mathematical modeling and pragmatic approaches in public health practice and during the pandemic. So thank you, Alex. I'll let you take it from here. Uh, thank you, Norman, for a kind introduction. So I, uh, um, I think the the thought about giving uh, and discuss this mathematical modeling and some of the uh, evidence that we use in public health is, of course, is quite quite topical as uh, we have a pandemic uh, um, that uh, is actually maybe somewhat affecting different different areas in in, in a different way. Um, uh, I, I thought it would be important to highlight some of the practices that we use in public health uh, and compare to them uh, clinical medicine, as well as to look at the mathematical models that have uh, been really proliferating at a, at, a, at a speed that is very, sometimes it's very difficult to follow. Like there's so many mathematical modeling now published. So they play some role. Uh, so we need just to understand what they can and what they cannot do. So I think this is uh, my title slide. Um, so actually the mathematical model part of my talk would be the second part. Uh, so because I, I thought it would be important to look at the uh, uh, pragmatic approaches that we use in, in public health decision making first and then mathematical modeling is of course is a part of it. Uh, so this is my disclosures. Um, but before we start, because this talk is going to be about mathematical modeling, so I thought you may want to uh, do some uh, uh, some exercise in mathematical modeling, kind of a very um, well, I wouldn't say it very simple. So see whether we actually solve this problem. I think this is called Seven Bridges of Königsberg. Um, uh, uh, and uh, uh, I think the task here is, can you walk this uh, old town has seven bridges and there's located on, on the rivers and there's uh, different land masses there. So there is a blocks uh, in this old town uh, where people live. And I think the task here is that, uh, can you walk through the town visiting each part of the town which is around the river and bridges. So, but you have to cross the bridge only once. So the only the reason why I give this kind of a ta task while you listen to <laughs> mathematical modeling talk is that uh, so one of the Swiss math Swiss mathematicians by name Euler um, uh, actually provided quite a comprehensive solution to this problem. Like nearly, I would think, writing a mini dissertation on it. And uh, it highlights, uh, and, the, and the same mathematicians is, uh, we use the formula to, uh, to solve some of the differential equations to calculate the reproductive rate of infection, which I'm gonna be talking later on. So anyway, so I, uh, when you listen to these presentations, you can may try to solve this problem. So we'll come back to that in the end of it. We know that we practice evidence-based medicine, so, and we all know the definition of it. 
So what I put here on this slide is uh, definitions of evidence-based public health. Is it different? So I put these three definitions. They evolved from 1997, and then they moved to 2004 and 2009. Um, so the first definition is very similar to evidence-based medicine. So they really use the same language that's used in the David Sackett's definition of evidence-based medicine. Uh, but then two subsequent definitions that you can see Evidence-based public health is the process of integrating science-based intervention with community preferences. I think community preference is the key word there. Uh, uh, so, and then subsequent definitions that um, actually defines it um, as a development, implementation, evaluation of effective programs and policies in public health through application of principles of scientific reasoning and including scientific uses of data and information systems and appropriate use of program planning mode. You may note that there is no word evidence in it, in that definition though, even though evidence-based public health. And it maybe just highlights the reality that sometimes we, we live in, in, in public health there. So here is another slide that uh, we're all familiar with the hierarchy of evidence. So, and I put this side by side. So there's actually not a lot of information. You need to actually dig into literature to find the hierarchy of evidence for evidence-based public health versus evidence-based medicine. So in, in, in clinical medicine, so we probably know that hierarchy. So I may concentrate on the evidence-based public health there. You can see how you can see on that hierarchy of evidence uh, elements like public health surveillance data, program evaluations, qualitative data, even media and marketing data, word of mouth, personal experiences. I think arguably, so they would not be accepted as evidence in evidence-based medicine, but in, in evidence-based public health, they are listed there. So there is also this kind of a gradient of uh, objective or subjective form of evidence that we use. I think I will kind of talk about the public health surveillance because it's very important in public health. So here is the, some of the distinctions between evidence-based medicine and evidence-based public health. Type of evidence in, in medicines we use to rely on randomized controlled trials. In public health, this is mostly cross-sectional study, quasi-experimental design and time series. The volume is much higher for clinical studies than for public health. Public health interventions are often the programs that involve combining several interventions within a community. And if you try to study them with randomized controlled trial, most of them would be a cluster randomized controlled trial, but it's often difficult to disentangle different interventions because it's, it's much harder to, uh, if, if you test some community-based intervention or educational campaign, so the people not necessarily gonna be living in a, in a bubble <laughs> completely and just, just to be subject to that intervention, even no matter how, how closely you uh, try to randomize and, and separate them as we do in the, in the clinic in the clinical medicine. So population-based studies also require longer time period between intervention and outcome, and a randomized control trial may not be ethical or practical for population-wide intervention, and even for some clinical interventions where I don't think we ever had a randomized control trial of whether ventilating preterm infants is, is, is a beneficial, and we, of course, do that. Um, and this is the last one, which is, of course, very relevant to this talk. Yes, randomized control trials are not timely for urgent health issues, such as infectious disease outbreaks, and for which public health decisions must be made quickly. We cannot really not to make a decision, and I think that that's important consideration to uh, important uh, point here. So here is the some of the type of data that we use in public health, so type of evidence um, that uh, may be used in evidence-based medicine to a lesser extent, and there is some principle that I highlighted. This is the surveillance data, pragmatic studies, program evaluations, and then I will talk about the precautionary principle and prevention paradox, which may be particularly relevant to this, to this talk. So, so this is public health surveillance. This is taken from the AHS website. So we, in public health, we, there is an elaborate definition of surveillance, <laughs> which, uh, so we usually teach to our residents in public health and preventive medicine program. So in short, surveillance is the information for action. And here is the number of actions that are written on the AHS website for what purpose we can use the surveillance data. You can see the last one there, providing basis for epidemiological research. And we're, of course, always debating. So what is the difference and what are the similarities between surveillance and research? So they both may use some research methods. So but the surveillance, the difference in surveillance is that I think their decisions are made based on the surveillance data are made much quicker than the decision based uh, derived from maybe from the, from the same data but analyzed 
um, maybe more comprehensively in the, in the, in the research context. And just to characterize this surveillance data, how we use it. So here is the data. This is surveillance data. Uh, so, and this is uh, showing your reported cases and incidents per 100,000 of pertussis for the last 100 years or close to 100 years. So there is an arrows there showing the implementation of the vaccine. Notably, if we look at the 1943, whole cell pertussis vaccine was introduced in 1943. Uh, so if we think about the surveillance data, this is uncontrolled. There is no control there. So, but anybody who looks at this, so would probably think that something that we have done in 1943 is actually made some something good. So, so the number of cases of pertussis dramatically declined since 1943 to 1980s. Then, of course, we had that uh, increase in the number of cases of pertussis there, so related to some side effects associated with the vaccine, so which prompted uh, introduction of a cellular vaccine. So this is the example of a surveillance data which is uncontrolled. So, but I think actually very helpful. So, and I think I I'm not going to be spending a lot of time to give you a, a lot of example, but this example are very abundant in public health when the surveillance data can be used very readily and and uh, uh, very effectively for for interventions. So, so the other part uh, I, I in my slide was uh, okay. So we in public health we use a pragmatic studies. So, and uh, I like to. Uh, contrast this by talking about vaccine efficacy, vaccine effectiveness. It's not that in clinical medicine, we don't use pragmatic study, we use pragmatic trials. So, but in public health, they use much more often. So, and I think the distinctions here between vaccine efficacy, every vaccine before it licenses undergoes clinical trials. So, but, uh, but we also need to look at the vaccine programs. And I think this is a difference between vaccine efficacy, which is trying to uh, estimate reduction in disease incidence in a vaccinated group compared to unvaccinated group under optimal condition. And this is a typical, um, uh, well, I think it's in, in a trial situation, of course, you are trying to maximize internal validity, but maybe just compromising on external validity or maybe at the expense of external validity. And this is best characterized by vaccine effectiveness study when we actually look at the real real life performance. And it's the vaccine may perform uh, well in the trial, but when they actually roll it out, in the community, so it, it may perform differently. So you may need to do it with observational studies. And also the vaccine effectiveness in itself is actually one component of the population effectiveness, which is afforded by the vaccine. So the other part is the vaccine uptake or vaccine coverage. So you may have a 100% efficacious vaccine, which nobody takes. So you have a zero protection in the community. I think it's this, this is important consideration. And the example I want to give here, so this is from the US. So this is a flu vaccine. So this is a we every 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 year, so we we have an influenza season, and we provide the flu vaccination. So, but the flu vaccine is not the in terms of effectiveness is not the best vaccine that we have. So, and of course, it depends on the on the match of the with the prevailing strains. And and I think we do look at the vaccine effectiveness. Uh, and and uh, for for vaccine for if we look at for measles, I think this is really bad because in measles we have a vaccine effectiveness of uh, of ninety nine percent of the two dose. So the concern, maybe some people don't take it, but the flu is, I think it's, it's so you have variable effectiveness there. And I think that's just emphasized that, uh, and sometimes when we talk about the uh, the other public health measures and we'll touch a little bit some controversial part of the masks in the in, in, in community in COVID situation. So we just want to bear in mind that I think we have a public health intervention that's sometimes not perfect, but I think they are, um, they are. so we are doing them every year. So then program evaluation is another type of data. So I just put it, the example from where I work, and uh, I think this is virtual TB clinic. So this is a study that's been done a few years back, which is actually looks at, at some indicators, the clinical indicators, uh, and comparing virtual clinic and, and outpatient clinic, when actually based in Edmonton, and the other one clinic that looks after patients uh, in, in, uh, in areas in rural community or First Nations communities. And it's actually performed comparative, actually, the, the, the indicators were uh, similar for for, um, for both virtual and outpatient clinic. Uh, and then as precautionary principle, this is a definition. So, and the definition is taken from uh, World Commission on Ethics and Scientific Knowledge of Technology. So when human activities may lead to morally unacceptable harm and the scientific, uh, and the, um, uh, and we're uncertain about those harms, the action shall be taken to avoid and diminish that harm. So of course that, that can also, that's a kind of a definition that given there. So of course you may say that 
um, if, if, if you're not sure about the benefit, but the harms perhaps uh, less, or, 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 or you think that a harm is not there, uh, but you're uncertain about benefit, I think that can be used as a, a, a kind of also a precautionary principle there. Uh, so why did I put it there? So in public health, we often use the precautionary principles. Every time that you hear the Canadian Food Inspection Agency pull some food from the shelves, so it's most certainly in many cases based on precautionary principles because we sometimes identify the, the causative organism or the causative the food that really been contaminated or uh, or sometimes not. Uh, so, but but we think that it's better to uh, uh, to to be on the side of caution. I think that's an example of precautionary principle. So this is a um, article published in BMJ. So how it relates to, like this is not really uh, using they're not arguing for using masks, but actually using we're using precautionary principles in in the discussions about the using masks in the community. And I think they made it um, some. Uh, some argument that why precautionary principles should be invoked in the case of the using community mask uh, for the for the COVID-19. And then another thing is that I really want to say about this prevention paradox. Uh, prevention paradox, um, I put the quote there, this is from the editorial that published in the Journal of Epidemiology Community Health, a tendency to discontinue preventive measures that are working is a familiar problem in public health. So the more successful a prevention program, the more quickly public opinion comes to trivialize the severity of the original problem and to view prevention as unnecessary and wasteful. The anti-vaccination movement is one manifestation of this dilemma. So, but I think we can think about even if we, if we this editorial published in the context of the COVID-19. And of course, there is a two considerations for the COVID-19 here is for this prevention paradox. So we can argue that the public health measures that were that were unprecedented for for what we have. Uh, so I, I think if they worked, so they resulted in a, in a smaller number of infections, and then our health system is not being overwhelmed. And then just when the memory of the original danger kind of wades a little, like wanes a little bit, so the people think, well, maybe it was an overreaction. And I think that 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 is a quite a common concern here. So it's and it's it is important to bear that in mind that the reason why we don't have polio or diphtheria is because we have a very effective immunization programs. I like to tell the story to my residents when I graduated from medical school in 1994. I graduated into the uh, multi-year outbreak of diphtheria, and one of the first patients that I saw as a qualified MD was patient with diphtheria, <laughs> so, which I have never seen cases of diphtheria after that. So, but, uh, and, and it's actually a good story. And the reason why it's a good story, because we have a very effective vaccine um, and we forget um, uh, what actually made it disappear. So, and here, this is just the editorial one. I like to kind of back up editorial with some data. I think this is the the CDC in Atlanta likes to use this slide. So this is published by the pediatrician in the Journal of Pediatrics. And, and this is a highlights the dynamic that occurs within a vaccination program. So essentially when the disease is present, uh, so, and, uh, so the people really are concerned about the severity of the disease. And they say, well, any, any, any intervention that you can offer at that time probably will be taken, taken up because, uh, because it's important so people don't want to have a disease. When the disease goes away because of that intervention, so that people start to rebalance in their kind of a risk assessment and they say, well, okay, maybe I'm, I'm worried more about the side effect of the vaccine because we, our memory of the disease waned and we don't really know how severe it can be, so, but we are concerned about uh, side effects. So when the side effects concern uh, becomes bigger, so it, it, it actually results in the drop in the vaccine coverage and the disease resurfacing. So, and then of course, rebalancing occurs when the people now are more worried about the disease uh, and they will take vaccine more likely. I think that's, uh, that's kind of uh, illustrates this uh, prevention paradox. And I think it's very important that in COVID context situation is the reason why uh, I, I look uh, ev like practically every day in the number of cases that occur around the world. And I think we set the daily record just this week, 142,000. So the fact that in Alberta, we don't have as many cases, I think it's reassuring, but we need not to lose the, 
uh, the kind of a bigger picture that this pandemic is not going away as yet. So it's driven by Latin America and some countries like India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and I would expect Indonesia to pick up. So I think so. some jurisdictions that achieve relative control or containment at this time, and I would be very cautious to use those terms. So actually may, may be more vulnerable to second wave because we, we may not be affected as much and maybe the herd immunity, we, we know about it, but in the countries like New York or Northern Italy, so probably have a, a larger population that could be potentially immune. And it's a, it's, it's a big, big if because we don't know much about it. But I think the prevention paradox in the COVID-19 is, is the one that I just described in this slide, as well as that we may be more um, at risk of a second wave. So therefore, it, it's important to keep, keep in mind what, what we do and, and not uh, um, and how public health measures should, should continue. So maybe in a, in a somewhat a different, maybe less aggressive way, but, but they, they still need to happen. So now I'm going to move on. I think this is uh, 20 minutes of my talk, so I think I'm doing OK in, in terms of the timing. But uh, now I'm going to talk a, a little bit uh, like more about the mathematical modeling. So, and maybe just before I completely move to mathematical modeling. So this is uh, the graph that I use from, uh, I think it's the data source from the European Center for Disease Control. Um, uh, but this is uh, showing exactly the, what I just illustrated uh, a few minutes ago. So that the Canada, Canada case is going down and in some other countries is going up. Uh, so, but we're still setting up the daily records. And if you talk within Alberta, so I actually Edmonton was doing actually rather well until maybe recently, I think when we have a little bit of uptick in the cases um, uh, of in, in, in Edmonton zone. So I think we need to look at this very regionally. So like in regionally, I mean, we can look at different countries, look at different continents, look in a different, within a country, different provinces, and within our province, we can look at different zones. Uh, so we'll talk about the reproductive rate of infection. I think the Edmonton had it the low one for quite some time. And now is actually, if you look at some models, they suggest that it's it's uh, it's actually around one or even above one. Uh, so, okay, so here here what, uh, where mathematical modeling kind of comes into this equation. So when when there is a public health emergency as a pandemic, so, so what, what do public health ask? And I think I just, this is what I would ask, and I guess everybody probably would ask this. So how many cases will likely occur? How many individuals will have severe illness? How many individuals will die? Can the health system can cope? How long would it last? And what are the societal consequences of pandemic or the control measures that we actually put in place to control it? And these are the questions that every, um, every medical officer of health, chief MOHs, every government officials who will be responsible for the uh, for response, public health response to the pandemic, probably will be asking, and, and they, they did ask this question. So in the, in the box that I put, what scientific evidence is available to help to answer these questions? And the other important part is, when can this evidence be available? So because you, you have to kind of have an answer to this question in some form or shape. So here's the my theory, so about uh, different types and uh, it's no particular order, but I try to follow some evidence uh, evidence uh, hierarchy there. So the randomized control trial, they absolutely imperative to test antivirals and vaccines. So so these are the ones that can actually definitively solve the problem. So and the randomized control trial for those type of uh, interventions is absolutely essential. The question, of course, when they're going to be done. So and this is the months or years. So then laboratory genomic studies, I think this is I put because we actually, the, the, the pathogen was sequenced pretty quickly, I, therefore I prompted me to put the days or weeks. So, and I think that may not happen. And this, in this pandemic, I think you can argue that it was happened relatively quickly, but in some circumstances it may take longer. So then descriptive epidemiological studies, a cohort study can take weeks to months, qualitative study months, so, okay, the only, the only thing that is available immediately to any question is an expert opinion. I think you can, you can find people can, can provide an opinion on day one, maybe, once they know about it. And then the mathematical modeling is actually come, comes up pretty high in terms of the timeliness of it, because it can be developed within days or weeks and months and can be refined. Then. But, the, but the basic models can be put out there very quickly. And I'm going to show some, because the the models start to be published in the journal like Lancet in January. So 
So in a preprint, I think they probably just uh, proliferate so quickly that in, even people who are actually interested in mathematical modeling and try to follow it, it, it just it, it may be hard to follow all mathematical modeling available there. So uh, what else we can do? We can use the analogy. So, and we have done it. So the SARS-1 and MERS are both coronaviruses. You can study biological virological similarities, mode of transmission, control measures. Influenza is another analogy we can use, previous pandemics, annual seasonal pandemics. You can, you can discuss experience and challenges with the vaccine. Again, talk about mode of transmission, control measures. So then we can talk about some role of uh, social determinants of health in tuberculosis. We can, draw some uh, uh, experience, public health messaging in HIV. So, but here is my point. So I think that's important to consider those, uh, those analogies. So, and, but it's important not to overplay those analogies. Uh, and here is the reason. So important to consider is epidemiological context. So the key here, not even the shape of those graphs that are showing, and the, the key there, so what is shown in the circles. So, the SARS-1 that was present in 2003, uh, in the entire duration of that pandemic, so it resulted in about 8,000 cases. So we have 8,000 cases in about two hours so for, this, for, for this pandemic. So I think if you actually look, um, if, you, if you look at this uh, similarities, I think they need to be taken into context of the epidemiology that we have. And I think, of course, this may feed into discussions about highly controversial one about asymptomatic transmission. Uh, so of course, if you have such a, uh, such a large, <laughs> large uh, uh, epidemic and rapidly developing, so then you may want to examine what, what other contributing factors are, are there to, uh, to the propagation of the outbreak. So now we're really moving into mathematical modeling. So, and uh, this is how this uh, potential type of studies can answer those questions. So a mathematical model, that's the definition, representation of a system, process, or relationship in a mathematical form using equations to simulate the behavior of the system or process under the study. So it's abstraction of the reality. It's a simplified representation of certain processes. Mathematical models can be characterized by assumptions about variables, which, cannot, which can change, and parameters which cannot change. Uh, and we just test in different relationship between them. So models can be used, the equations or computer code, the, the most important part is that model can test the hypothesis by comparing reconstructed simulated data with empirical data. And this is particularly useful when evaluating policy interventions which cannot be reversed and for which selecting controls is not possible that we in the modeling call it counterfactuals. So this is the modeling cycle. So you think about the problem, you then put that problem into mathematical equations and then you simulate, or you solve that equation. So, or if you use more sophisticated models, you run the model and you, you get some output and you think, well, that, does it really make sense what your model produces? And if it makes sense and you, and you validate it using a rather rigorous way of validating it, then you can test various interventions in the model. You can run a randomized control trial out of the model just using simulated data. So there's type of the models is there called white box, gray box, and black box. I think that some of them are rather simple and actually use the analytical methods. And if you look, if you think about the evidence-based medicine, I think they are very unbiased. So, so these are all mathematical formulas. They will give you a very, very concrete results. What may be biased in the model is that what you put in them. So, and I think you can hear, so the models are as good as the assumptions that behind them, that is correct. But the, the, the logic of the model is very important too. And then there is this black box model. So this is data-driven machine learning uh, type of, uh, of, of modeling. I think these are, uh, this is, is much, much more complex. So they are, as I said, they're data-driven. Uh, and to unpack, so every algorithm that is used there is, 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 is more difficult than looking at the basic model like SIR model as we, we, we're gonna be talking about it. So then there is the deterministic versus stochastic model, then the individual model versus agent-based model or aggregate model, static versus dynamic. Maybe I'll just talk a little bit about deterministic versus stochastics. Deterministic is, 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 has uh, no uncertain components for fixed starting variables. The deterministic model will always produce the same result, but the stochastics model are better because they are, uh, they think in probabilities. So, and this is like in, in the real world. They, let, they think about it in terms of probabilities and distributions. Uh, so they're not trying to predict how many cases we'll have on this particular day, 
but they will just give you some direction so they give you the, the options so they can look at the probability of the size or, or the range of the outbreaks and i think this is uh, most of the models are stochastics but but some are deterministic and then there is this agent based model so that i think you can model quantities like you 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 put individuals into groups and and you uh, a guide with the with the equations or some kind of a logic so how those individuals within groups are move around but you can also move uh, you can also model individuals and the individuals that means uh, um, like you uh, every individual in the model will have some intrinsic characteristics but then they pl- put in some kind of a network and they interact with each other with the network and then you can model transmissions within household within schools within workplaces with long-term care facility so this type of models is a more computationally intensive and i think they may have a there is a more challenging to calibrate them so but i think sometimes they can offer additional additional benefits so how do we derive parameters for for the model so parameters can be derived from other studies published there's two different main things so you can, you can you can look at some other studies and 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 put this as a value into the model or you can work backwards so you can uh, your parameters can be estimated by comparing the fit of the model um with a simulated empirical data so it's through the process which we call calibration of parameter estimation if further uncertainty exists then sensitivity analysis can be performed and those sensitivity analysis and i guess in the worst case scenario you can you can make it, you can use the educated guess for the parameters this is uh, not the preferred option for anyone and there is a sum of the applications of that in mathematical models in the early stages of uh, of the outbreaks you will uh, want to estimate reproductive rates so you can test various interventions forecast utilization of healthcare resources and you can look at the unintended consequences from epidemics as well so here is another uh, couple of studies that use uh, this is uh, on the left hand side is the is the uh, is there of course the traditional epidemiological study that assessed the risk of developing pertussis in relation to timing of the previous of the last vaccination and this is a meta analysis showing the number 1.33 and i think that widely been interpreted as the waning of immunity uh, so but uh, but waning of immunity is a, is an intrinsic characteristic and the risk of the infection may be driven not only by intrinsic characteristic but also how much contacts are occurring in the community and this is the model that showed uh, uh, that actually reproduced that uh, relative risk so of uh, 1.33 with a relatively modest weighting of immunity but actually looking at the contact rate within schools so essentially there is a two components there so when we think about the infection that occurring so it's driven by intrinsic characteristics of individuals but as well as how how many opportunities for infections they have in the communities and in the networks So here is the basic SIR model. Uh so and what we're going to do here so we're going to do a little bit of a uh, I will do a little bit of illustration. So this is a SIR model. Uh this has actually been published um uh, in 1927. So this is the differential equations. So it's essentially so you have a three buckets there so you have a susceptible, you have an infected and you have a recovered or removed. So and essentially individuals move between those three buckets and the model can then generate um this kind of curve and i guess what i'm going to do now is i'm going to stop sharing my presentation and i'm going to share something else okay. different screen so you should now see my spreadsheet so uh, i think this is the formula that is you probably could see me manipulating it so what i have done here so is in the SIR model there is a this is again it's a very basic one so you have uh, three buckets susceptible infected and recovered or removed and the the rates between mo- movements between those buckets is governed by this beta and gamma so and this this one is the effective contact rate and the gamma is a kind of a how long does it take to recover so if you think that the disease lasts 10 days the gamma will be 1 divided by 10 and the beta is a, is a, is a how many contacts uh one uh, in, uh, infected individual will make with susceptible people or uh or how many days to take for one for the infected individual to uh, uh to infect the susceptible one uh so and depends on those two parameters there so so the model really generate this kind of a 
three different lines here. So this, this is the blue line is a susceptible one. This is this is I don't know what the color is. Okay, so it's a, it's a recovered one. But the most important one is the orange one. So when we talk about the flattening of the curve, we want to flatten this part. So on this y-axis is really is a, is the proportions of the individuals out of hundred percent. And this in this particular circumstances in the simulation. So you say in twenty two days, so you will have a fifty. And of course, this is very. This is illustration. This is just. Don't take it. This is not a reality. This is just to, just to show you. So in this case, I think the peak will be achieved in 22 days. So and I think you start with the with the uh, with the uh, starting conditions when you have a 99.9% .9 of individuals susceptible, and there is a just one percent or one tenth of a percent of people who are infected, and there's nobody is removed, and then you can go through this. This is kind of equation. What I represented here in the Excel spreadsheet is this equations there. So, and this is simulated like this. The point here is that if you, you can't really change this much because if the disease is kind of a fixed, if, if, if you need 10 days to recover, so I think that's, you need 10 days to recover. But what you can do, you can affect the contact rate, effective contact rate. And if you, if I change this to, let's say to 0 0.4, so you can see what it happens to this. So I think now your peak is not at 60% of the population and maybe 40% and it takes a little bit longer. So also, of course, if, if the disease lasted longer, for example, if I do this, um, so that makes it longer. So you, you, you can see how much much more difficult to control the disease because if, if you don't, people recover within 10 days, they recover with 20 days. So this is, this is much, more, much more difficult to, to control it. And of course, if uh, we uh, look at this, um, if you have a vaccinations, if I suddenly substitute number of susceptible with a 10%, so you have no infection <laughs> because if your whole population was vaccinated to start with. Okay, I'm just gonna go back to my uh, to my others. I'll stop sharing this and we'll start sharing my other. Okay, so can you see my slides now? No. Okay, so how can I? Okay, I. I see the slides, but I don't see. Okay. Okay. Just, okay. So just bear with me. Okay. 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 So you should see it now. Can you see my slides now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So essentially, this is the equation we're talking about. This line. So this is a reproductive rate. This is a very key uh, number that we need to look at the uh, in in the big. Understanding of the of the of the infection because this is defined as the number of cases that um, one individual who's infectious can uh, can infect during the during no, not an incubation period during the infectiousness period. For example, if you can get something like this for any situation, so uh, so you can actually look. This is like we have a six individuals who. Uh, who are infectious, this individual infected three, this the individual infect one, this is this individual infected five, then you can calculate the reproductive rate of infection of 2.3. But I think, a real, I mean, you may not have this, so or you may have it in, in uh, like you usually have the epic curve that associated with the outbreaks. Um, okay, so how oh, is it not expensive? So, and, and, and I think there is a multiple, when we, when we look at the, the reproductive rate of infection, and by the way, in my, my illustration, reproductive rate of infection would be gamma, would, would be beta divided by gamma. So if I, if I use 0 0.6 for beta and 0 0.1 for gamma, the reproductive rate of infection would be six. So, but there is a many other ways, of course, if you know that contact rate, and this is a very key in epidemiology because how do you know how many contacts are we, we, we making? So if I walk on the street and I, and, and I made a contact and somebody passed by, so that I make a contact, that is actually some other mathematical reasoning actually separate the effective contact with, the, with just the simple contact as well as the risk per discrepant contact. So that means not every contact will result in transmission of the infection. So, but going back maybe to reproductive rate of infection, this is, I just listed multiple methods that can be used because we are estimating of the contact may be quite difficult. So, and you need to look at some data that may be coming out, uh, out of the outbreak that, that you, are, you are facing. So, and the most data that you usually have would be some sort of the epic curve that you will construct. 
And from that epic curve, you can use you can you can look at what we call generation time and serial intervals. So the generation time is much more difficult to derive because it's it, it's a time between the individual first individual become infectious until the next one becomes infectious, and the serial interval is 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 actually looking at the symptoms. So this is much you you may you may get serial interval much more readily than generation time, but you can you can use them as a as a as a proxy of the other. So and this is the method that I listed there. So from this nice review that have been published in BMC Medical Informatics. So different methods and probably not all of them are listed there. Uh, and for those of you uh, like who may may just want to see well what is the shortcut to calculate this, I think there are some mathematicians and computer scientists specialists actually created this tools. So all you can go to this website and you all you need to have serial intervals and you add the curve and it will generate the uh, reproductive rate of infection and some some studies that are rapidly published and sometimes using this tool that is available for us. So now in the in the I'm getting getting the last third of my or maybe the last quarter of my talk. So and we're going to talk a bit of some of the models. This is this is the models from Wuhan. So this is in the early stages of the pandemic. So the, the primary consideration was this was published in Lancet in, in January. So uh, I think in January. So, uh, but I, I, I think they, they look in mostly estimating the reproductive rate of infection because the people are concerned, will we have an outbreak and how big the outbreak will be? So this is the first example of the model. Then there is an, uh, like when we pandemic evolving, then you will actually have a different, uh, uh, different questions to ask. This is an Imperial College model, so that this has really been instrumental in, in, in guiding the decisions about uh, social distancing and, and actually putting put many European countries on lockdown. So this model is look at, this is actually an individual-based model, more agent-based model. So they, 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 they model the transmission of contacts between susceptible infections in the household, workplace, and school. So they, they, they use the different, uh, like a social mixing surveys to kind of orient themselves to make sure that it's more realistic. They use incubation period, reproductive rate of infection that was derived maybe from other studies. So, and what they have, what they concluded is that if you have an unmitigated outbreak, so, and I think this is unmitigated outbreak, so they calculated or predicted the number of deaths that would occur. And that number is a 510,000 deaths that occur within the UK. And of course, they, they, they model this different, different mitigation strategy, do nothing, case isolation, case isolation, also quarantine, uh, so school closures in the university. Interesting in that model, because I think there is a, there is a lot of this agent-based model and look at the schools and universities. I think there is a, the most significant intervention was the school closure in that, in, in that particular model. So and this updated model, look at the attack rate so this is one of the most perplexing part of this uh, pandemic is that how many undiagnosed that are available, uh, how many undiagnosed individuals there. So you can you can model the number of uh, cases there, um, but you uh, but but you want to know like how many of them perhaps not presented to care. So and I think some of those imperial college models been uh, will actually been calibrated using what they called not a case fatality rate but infection fatality rate, which is a little bit higher. So then case fatality rate. So therefore you may see that some differences that were associated with the Imperial College model results with some other models there. So here is the model that, uh, so I work with a group in Saskatchewan and we've been doing modeling on, on measles and pertussis and, and many other pathogens, chickenpox. So this is the model that have been developed by a group, group in Saskatchewan, but we, we run it on Alberta data. So this is, a, this is a, your SIR model, but you can see how much more complex it is. Instead, instead of having just S, I, and R, you have a, you have a, how many, there was different, different, uh, different, different boxes there. So, so different boxes that represents individuals in the models. And then, then if you, if I want to simplify it, I think this is a red ones. These are the ones that are visible to us to the healthcare systems. This is the people who get sick, they get symptomatic, and they, uh, uh, and 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 they become uh, visible to the system. And then the, uh, this is a bunch of the parameters that 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 we use, and I think this is the the, the key that we review those parameters. But. Uh, but I think we just have no time to for each model to investigate those parameters. And this is a sum of the this model used the particle filtering technique to to match it to empirical data. And I think this is the illustrations how it matches to empirical data. And this is the model calculates the reproductive rate of infection. So using that complicated complicated formula there, 
and this is important one, is that this model is also predict the number of a diagno undiagnosed cases. These are the cases that are not presenting to care, but may exist in the community because reproductive rate of infection is important because you not only you have reproductive rate of infection, you also need to know how many people there. So because if you if you have a thousand people having a reproductive rate of one, so that means thousand people transmitted into on average, another person. But if you have only 10 infected people with a reproductive rate of one, that's, that's at population level is much more benign issue. So here's another, uh, another model and study that using uh, wearing masks. Uh, so this is quite a controversial issue. So, but this is the, using the uh, branch and transmission model. And they, what they looked here, so they look at the different reproductive rate, uh, uh, initial reproductive rate of infections, and they model the assumptions that, uh, and it's completely assumptions of how effective mask is, is a maybe, maybe is a completely different point. So they just make an assumptions whether graduated effectiveness of the mask between 25 and 75% and how many people wearing them. And they, they, they conclude, of course, this is very logical that if a lot of people wearing them, even at the smaller, if, even if the mask are not effective, they may actually confer population benefit. And this is this extension of the same model. So I think this model actually, a good thing is that they model phase wearers and non wearers. They, they model the potential reinfection by mask wearers. And here is the results. This is the, the red, uh, red graphs there. So they, they go, uh, if, if in this particular model, and of course, this is subject to the assumption that this model is, 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 uh, have, uh, made. So if, uh, if this is a 25% wearing mask, this is 100% wearing mask. This is, we're looking at that red line there. So in the bump that occur, once you remove the lockdown, so if uh, this is the argument this paper makes is that if you remove the lockdown or, or if we move to the reopening of our economy, if you wear a mask, I think you can actually have a much fewer number of cases there. So this is modeling of shield immunity. So this is the principle that we, in our SRI model, if you introduce another parameter alpha, so you essentially, between susceptible and infectious people, you insert individuals who are um, immune because they already had an infection. And if you can, if you can quantify it with this, a reliable and validated serological test, you can actually have a reduction in the number of cases of the dynamic there. So, and this is another model, and this could be one of the last model I before I wrap up. So this, the model is actually uh, look at the epidemic control using contact tracing, but what they have done here, so they look at the proportion of asymptomatics uh, and asymptomatics in, as, as in terms of the contribution to the, uh, to the reproductive rate of infection. And they estimated it that pre-symptomatic uh, contribute actually even more from symptomatic, but, but truly asymptomatic contribute relatively, relatively small play a relatively small role in the transmission dynamic of, uh, uh, of this pandemic. Uh, good. So some final thoughts, and we still have need some time to talk about our seven bridges. So, so, so uh, here is my thoughts. So we rely on, like, uh, we rely on rigorous scientific evidence to guide both public health practice and, and uh, clinical practice. However, available evidence may differ. So in public health emergency, decisions to protect public needs to be made often before definitive evidence emerges. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, so that we just cannot postpone that decision. So in, in, in the situation of the uh, pandemic, of course, so when we don't have a vaccine or antiviral medications to, to have a definitive treatment or definitive prevention, so we rely on the broader public health measures and even though some people agree with them, some people disagree, I think this is the only options that we have. It's how we need to be carefully using them. So maybe maybe re respond to the situation as it evolves. So conducting studies post pandemic may help during emergencies in future, but epidemiological context is important. So I think it would have been nice if we had a randomized control trial about the wearing mask after the H one N one pandemic. Of course, I, I, I think we will, and it was all difficulties that associated with running the randomized control trial for. Um, for public health interventions, but the attempts are there. So, for example, Norway is is, is published the uh, protocol. They want to randomize school openings. So, they I mean essentially they do the cluster and propose to do cluster randomized trial of some schools opening and some schools maybe opening later and see whether they're going to have some differences. So, we'd we'll be very interested to see what what the result would be. And then on the mathematical models, so when we make the decision, we run a mental model, so which may not be obvious. So we very, 
like when we decide to start empiric treatment for the case of TB meningitis, so we may not be have absolute certainty. So, but we have we run kind of mathematical mo- not mathematical model. We run the mental model in our head. But mathematical model is something like a mental model that you can actually express in the equations. So it can test theories, help to learn from evidence faster, serve what if questions, identify inconsistency. You can actually identify bring some questions into the, into the light and, and help to to design some other studies that, that will be important to uh, to understand the co- complex problem. So different scientific fields may have different philosophies, and I actually think it's for our collective benefit to learn from it. And the other point is that should mathematical modeling be added to hierarchy of evidence for either evidence-based medicine or evidence-based public health, and perhaps we also need to develop some critical appraisal checklists for mathematical models so this, the same way was we have a lot of checklists for all sorts of other studies. And I think I wonder whether you solved the question. My, my, my task was uh, uh, with the seven bridges of Königsberg, and, and I think this is the answer. So you cannot actually do that. So And the Euler was a Swiss mathematician who uh, we use the formula in our SIR calculations of reproductive rate of infection. So he concluded that you cannot. Uh, you cannot visit all parts of that city so without uh, w- crossing w- one bridge at a time and i think that some of the subsequent solution to this problem was related to the vertices and and the sides and i think if you if shape is traversable all vertices are uh, even degrees or exactly two vertices are odd order and the rest are even and this is this is what this problem is and there is a four odd vertices that means every every vertice here so it has um not an even number so therefore you cannot <laughs> so this is the shortcut but if you have a different solution as i said this mathematicians produce nearly mini dissertation for this so i will uh, take some questions uh the unsolvable riddle um so we have a few questions and um i think uh that was great alex it was a really nice overview um, the first one I'm going to start off with is um, asking about how mo- the model would be affected if we were to identify that some of the patients that had been um, already uh, infected were still susceptible to reinfection. How would that affect the modeling? I think this is uh, this is an interesting question. Of course, so if some individuals remain susceptible if they've been infected, I think this is of course the debate that we're having whether having an, having the COVID nineteen results in a durable protection. So, so I think what you need to represent in the model some kind of a rate of transition from from R to S. So essentially, you have SIR model, and of course, if you had incubation period, it will be SEIR, which is exposure there. But if you're moving back from the recovered to susceptible, you need to represent as a mathematical equation to some transition back from R to S. That means some individuals who recovered was using some some mathematical relationship at what rate they will go back to be susceptible again. So, and I think this is this is if you use it in 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 uh, in compartmental model like SIR model. If you use it in agent based model, some people then you you also look at that network because there are some maybe preferential people who will be uh, like if if you look for example maybe some immunocompromised people will remain susceptible and some other people will remain recovered. So therefore, you may represent a different population there. So within a model. So that the SIR model is in the simplest thing there. So, but you, if you if you associate uh, some of the model that was used for particle filtering, you can add different ages. You can add any other characteristics, and you can have a, in parallel several models. Each of them will follow that kind of a pathway. But I think that in short, you need to find the representations, whether it's through some kind of a uh, uh, some kind of a simple rate that you put, or more complex representations. If this is that that. Uh, a lack of recovery or lack of immunity is affect some people versus the others. I think you partially answered this question, but it's related to the R naught. Um, so, if you have, uh, the, as the R naught is changing through the disease process, um, how does that impact um, the the current state as the model changes? 
I think there are not like I, I mentioned maybe briefly. I think we can we can. I think there is a R naught is really R at the naught time. So this is the your initial reproductive rate of infection. This is by definition means if you have a completely susceptible population and no control measures there. So that, that is what R naught is. So we, we what we mostly look at the R value and it's sometimes labeled as RT or RE, which is effective reproductive rate. So these are the ones that are changing. So this is this is this is and and we actually can calculate it as at the time dependent reproductive rate. So, and I think this is when, when we use, when the people become, uh, like if you, if you put some protection measures, so you essentially reduces the contact rate. And if the contact rate is derived using some kind of mathematical calibration process, and I think it will address that number will change. That, that's why we, we see if we, we see the, the number of cases going down, it's just probably going down because of the prevention measures that have been put in place. The other way, of course, how you can, Affect it, of course. You you can make it. You you can affect it through the immunization. But I think it it's um, it's the effective reproductive rate that is changing, not the R not R not is is a is a kind of a theoretical concept. But uh, but then a lot of models can calculate with the methods that I I provided. So uh, it depends how your uh, epic curve is growing or developing. If it if it's going down, of course it is 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 going down. But uh, of course, in, in the model that I use it with the particle filtering is the particle filtering is an interesting process. It's more of machine learning because if we, we, we feed some data that goes uh, from real surveillance data, but there's also a set of equations are there. Uh, and and the, the particle filtering algorithm try to find the fittest particle. <laughs> so the particle means the set of the values for each of those individual boxes there. So that actually represents the real surveillance data the best. And it says, well, if this is, this is a good representation, so I'm going to keep it. And then the model is constantly resampling it to say, well, I'll keep the fit particle and I discard the weak one that does not match with the real data. So, and I think once they find the, the fittest, the, the fittest representation in those values, then it can run the formula and calculate the RT. So, or IE, rep effective reproductive rate. That's why we see that in Edmonton, for example, this is one of them, somewhat of a concerning, but is that in Edmonton, the, 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 I think the, we had a RT or effective reproductive rate is 0 0.5 or even, but, but now it's kind of creeping up back to, back, back to one. So given the number of cases that we've seen recently. So I think we only have time for one more question. So I'm just going to ask Alex. Um, I, I think people are really curious about what the impact of this is going to be locally. So, um, you know, Giovanni here mentions that uh, you had talked about the social impact of the public health measures. Um, and, you know, that's something to consider. And given that most of this information, um, you know, a lot of times is retrospective after you've gotten the data and so on. Um, it seems that that piece of it stays out um, in terms of determining the public health measures. So, you know, do you have any insights into what ultimately um, it goes into making those decisions and based on what you've observed so far and now, you know, we're seeing this, this uptrend in, in Edmonton, um, what, what are your thoughts about what's, what's to come based I don't know. I cannot really predict what what what's to come. I think what uh, I but some of those models can potentially can do the short term forecast. And I think no question that we can as as the as the wealth of data that we have and we refine the data better. And as we have the epidemiological studies that now tells us a little bit better what proportions of asymptomatic versus presymptomatics are. So we can we can use that data in the model that potentially. Uh, make it a more accurate prediction. And I think this the, the challenge is, of course, once you make some changes in the model, you have to recalibrate it. I think that's 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 the difficulty here. So yes, you you even some models that have been published, but now if you have new information now, you need to go back and recalibrate those models so that it actually makes makes sense in terms of the output. But the questions about the consequences is very important. And actually this is not I wouldn't say that it's it is on the people's radar. And in fact uh, I actually think in we we trying to build the model that actually would would uh, would uh, would address those consequences of the preventive measures because you can look at the mental health issues or or the or some chronic diseases for the individuals who may be afraid to go to the hospital and they may have some problems associated with it and not related to COVID related to the COVID containment strategies and I think that that is I wouldn't say this is this is just not. People have been so consumed by building the more 
pressing issues. I think this is at some point, in my view, it's definitely will come. So that the models will be developed in, in this in, in this area that actually will test. So what is the mental health effect? And all in the models, I think the biggest challenge is, is to what would you use to parameterize them? So how can you express in mathematical terms how many people, for example, didn't go for the ch routine checkup and may suffered some relapse in their diabetes or some, some other conditions. I think it will come. So that it would be my prediction. So like how good those models would be would depend on how reliable data we would have in terms of the parameterize it. So, and in terms of what's to come here, I think in like we, we uh, I think it's, it's difficult to predict whether we can are gonna have a second wave or third wave or more than, <laughs> more than three waves. My view, my personal view of it, I think if we maintain some level of control measures, like at the population level, remember this is a this is a public health crisis. This is a public health crisis that the, the acute care is kind of a can be a, a victim of it. So, but I think the the pandemic is really spreads in the community and then permeates in the hospitals. It would be quite unlikely that it just starts in the hospital sites. So, so we may. I think we may need to protect individuals who work in, who visit the hospital, how we manage patients in the hospital, but we need to look at the community. I think this is, this is the most important part. So we need to keep infection at bay in the community. So how we do that, so we, uh, the models can help with it. So with making some, some predictions, but I actually think we may be somewhat even underestimating the herd immunity because the herd immunity is coupled with the behavior. So I think if if people in New York now, uh, okay, so some serological studies suggest 20% of them had an infection. So if you assume that they all protected because of that, so you may say 20% is not enough in the SIR model to, to rend the herd immunity. But if you couple that with the behavioral changes that occur, I actually would be somewhat optimistic. So of course, in Alberta, if we do the prevalent study, I think my gut feeling would be that we'll probably find like a single low single digits of individuals who have actually been been infected. So we are probably need to be practicing social distancing in those public health measures a little bit with there may be a greater intensity. Like everybody should be doing this. And of course if we can do some some very basic public health measures, I think they should be embraced. And and like my point is that we need to look at the community to protect the hospital. So no, not necessarily other way around. Because that, that's how those pandemics unfolded. Yeah, that just comes back to the um, Grand Round presentation we had a couple of weeks ago from Dr. Lewanchuk. So, Alex, that was fantastic. Thank you on behalf of the department. Um, thank you for putting that together. I think it was really useful for us to have that background and, and understanding of, of how this is all developed. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day.